before we start, I think we've had two long days. I, I'm kind of shifting my presentation now. Let's start by standing up, and I, I want everybody to um, feel the length of their spine. A lot of times, oftentimes we feel like our spine ends kind of at the bottom of our neck or at our neck, but I want us to, let's start by putting um, our tongue at the roof of our mouth, so feeling that, and as you can see in the image, um, and I got this exercise from Benjamin Steinhardt, so this is not mine, but if you feel these two points right above your ears, you can actually get a better sense of the length of your spine, which should end more towards the top here. So I want you to put your tongue at, uh, yeah, the, tongue at the roof of your mouth and kind of massage that your, uh, this point, these points on top of your ears. You should be able to feel that length of your spine. Right? You kind of... And it kind of makes you lengthen your spine a bit. Now, the next thing I want you to do is kind of feel your balls and sockets of that hip. Feel that, feel that. Oftentimes, you know, we're going to, we, we would use more of our forearm and, and our arm like that, but sometimes we need to lean, and we kind of get, need to be aware of that hip. So once you've found that ball and socket, I want you to kind of just move your hips clockwise, counterclockwise. Just feel your body a little more. Be aware of that body. And so this is some, a little exercise that we can do for body awareness. Um, and we'll get more into that also in the, in the presentation. So you guys can all sit down. Thank you. Today, I'm excited to share with you my research on applying sport injury studies to solutions for piano-related injuries. This is quite a personal topic since I was injured just a few years ago. And I myself experienced the pains of injuries sustained through piano practice and performance. As we know throughout history, pianists have faced various challenges related to injury. We, this is um, made known to us by the experiences of figures like Robert Schumann, if you guys didn't know, Alexander Scriabin, and more recently, uh, we have Leon Fleischer. I explored the application of sport injury to piano-related injury in my study. I discovered the value of adopting a biopsychosocial approach. And we will return to that term later in the presentation. So the biopsychosocial approach incorporated with sports injury interventions provide a better support and guidance to injured pianists and piano students, fostering a more holistic um, approach and recovery. So disclaimer, uh, the following information I will share with your ideas based on personal experience, conversation with other injured pianists, and readings. And I hope that I inspire a more complete view of piano playing and piano-related injury for both teachers and performers. So initially, I created this presentation really um, with a target audience for piano teachers. But still, I think these ideas can spark a different perspective as a pianist and student artist and provide various resources that may be helpful in your practice and performance. So this is Recovering from a Piano-Related Injury, Holistic Solutions Based on Sport Injury Research. So I tweaked this a bit and try to make it a little more relevant to um, practicing pianists, uh, but still provide teacher solutions. So before we delve into the specifics, let's take a moment to acknowledge the wealth of resources available to us on piano-related injury prevention. For those who are unfamiliar, I just want to throw this out there because these are great resources, and not just for those who are injured, but just to prevent injury in the first place. First, we have Dorothy Taubman's Taubman approach. These are videos and writings that describe natural and healthy playing techniques based on cooperative and ergonomic movements of the pianist in reflection to the piano. So those are huge words, but all it's saying is playing in the natural way in relation to the instrument. And all her, a lot of her videos and writings, as well as Edna Golansky, her champion, a lot of their videos are available online on YouTube and you can search those. We also have Barbara Lister Sinks, Freeing the Caged Bird. It is a DVD uh, demonstrating injury preventive technique. Barbara Lister Stink is still alive and active. She teaches in South Carolina if you're interested. She has a training program um, and a master's degree, if I'm not mistaken, for piano um, preventive, injury preventive piano technique. Now we have also Thomas Marx, what every pianist needs to know about the body, and it talks about um, piano and body mapping. So it might be something interesting to look at. 
This one I think is a great resource, Penelope Rascal's The Complete Pianist. It's a comprehensive book that covers many aspects of piano playing, from posture to touch and tone production, chords, octaves, memorization, reading, and so much more. It, it's like this thick and this wide. Um, I haven't gone through all the topics here, but if you find something, anything related to piano playing actually, especially piano um, injury, you may wanna get that book and it it's, has valuable information. Um, additionally, uh, oh, also, we have, it's quite recent, um, Laura Dayal and Brenda Riston's Adaptive Strategies for Small-Handed Pianists. So it's a book of valuable resource, I think, also for what the title mentions exactly, um, Small-Handed Pianists. And majority of women have much smaller hands than, let's say, Rachmaninoff, as well as students, our, if you're teaching, students are little kids will have much smaller hands. And so this book is really great to, um, it talks about a lot of things that you can do for passages and phrases that may be difficult for a small-handed pianist. We also have other um, resources like Richard Norris's The Musician's Survival Manual. It's a free book, you can get that online, and it's by a medical doctor, I think that's important, and who is also a guitarist, and he imparts a lot of knowledge about anatomy and its role in musicians playing. Then we have Janet Horvath's Playing Less Hurt. This is a guide that talks about the physicality and psyche of musicians based on her experience also as an injured musician, actually the associate principal cellist of Minnesota Orchestra. But lastly, Dorothy, I mean, we have so many more resources. This is just stuff that I read and the, this is where a lot of the information come from. But lastly, there's Dorothy Bishop's The Musician as Athlete, which provides a broader perspective by drawing parallels between musicians and athletes, which really inspired my research because pianists are fine motor athletes anyway, right? And so we can learn a lot from the much vaster amount of research on sports-related injuries because Although, fortunately, research for piano-related injuries is now becoming more prominent, research on athletes have been going on for many years, and so we can really learn a lot from them. So to address piano-related injuries, we can draw inspiration from the field of sports, and one crucial study by Wiese Bjornstal emphasizes the importance of the biopsychosocial approach, which is what I mentioned earlier. So biopsychosocial approach, it's a handful, but according to her, According to Vise Bjornsel, injury is associated with a complex multitude of risks, consequences, and outcomes. That means to say that injury is not just simply you're, in, you're, you're hurt, you damage the part of your body, but really it's a result of many risks and it affects the individual in many complex ways as well. So, as I said, it occurs because of controllable behavior, so things that we can address which we'll talk about, some un uncontrollable risks inherent in sport, training, or competition, or piano practice, piano performance, piano competitions, and the specific risk vulnerabilities of the individual. So specific risks in the of the pianist, which like I mentioned, small-handed pianists, that's a, um, that's a risk for the individual. Maybe your environment, maybe some pressures. So DC Bjornstel made this model. The biopsychosocial approach considers biological, physical, psychological, and social cultural factors. These factors encompass exactly what she says controllable behaviors, uncontrollable risks, and um, vulnerabilities of an individual. So let's just break it down a little bit. Under intrinsic factors, something that's more personal is the biological factors, which is basically your body, right? We have, uh, for example, um, she put their body composition, nutrition. Another thing that's personal will be your thought process. So that's the psychological factors. Maybe for athletes, she put uh, body image and beliefs. Now we go to the more extrinsic side, the more external side. There are factors in the physical environment like weather, facilities, equipment, but also the social cultural side. So the environment, but less tangible. So rules and media. Now identifying and addressing these factors uh, research showed, can significantly enhance injury response and prevention. So when you're aware of all these factors that you can control and the risks that maybe are uncontrollable and your vulnerabilities, then you can better recover from your injury and you can better prevent it in the first place. So now I kind of invite you to reflect on your own and your students, again, because it's kind of tailored to the words teachers, but your, your own playing and think about different factors that play a role 
in the pianist setting. So what factors might affect you biologically? Maybe some psychological factors, your factors in your environment that may affect you and your playing and possibly um, be a risk to injury. So in my working model, uh, inspired by Vise Bjornstel's study, I have identified specific risk factors under each category. These factors involve, again, choices, exposures, hazards that pianists encounter in their practice and performance. Now, I want to emphasize this is my own working model. It's just something I've come up with, and I might add to it, I might subtract to it, of some risk factors I identified based on my own experience and conversations, and the readings as well. So you may reflect on your own experience and come up with other risk factors that are applicable to you and your students. So I'll kind of run down it a little bit, and we'll um, discuss more. So biological, your, your body, hand span, as I keep mentioning, because it is one of the major uh, risk factors for piano-related injury. Hand span, posture, which I know your teachers are always talking about. Biomechanics, meaning the way you, you play, the, your technique. Warm-up and stretching quality. Do you even warm up when you practice, or do you just go ahead and play your entire repertoire with cold muscles, and that can lead to injury? Um, overuse of your, your muscles, and in line with that, your practice habits and its intensity. And as well as nutrition, sleep quality. Do you take care of your body? This seems like a silly thing, but all these things affect your everyday activities, and your everyday activities include piano playing, right? I hope so. Um, on the other side, we have, uh, on the extrinsic factors, but physical, tangible, we have the, the bench height, which I think your teachers always talk about, and, and I think um, Dr. Elise was talking about as well. Bench height and distance. Instrument, or key action quality. So instrument, a lot of our modern keyboards have huge keys. And again, small-handed pianists, that may be a big factor for them. Um, if you guys do not know, there is a movement that are, um, to make keys with smaller sizes. So they actually now produce smaller size keys, which you can put on your own pianos. Um, but also key action quality. Is the piano that you're playing every day super heavy that it can wear you out easily, right? Um, Notation on scores when reading. Again, that may seem silly, but many times when this, the notations of scores are really small, pianists have the tendency to go like that, and that can really affect your posture, right? So we want to be aware of that. As well as temperature of the practice space, it might be always cold where you're practicing, and you don't warm up as well, and that will affect your body. Um, length of practice or performance and amount of required repertoire, which is self-explanatory. Now, intrinsic factors, psychological, life event stress. Everybody goes through life event stress, and at some times, it might be more intense than others. And as teachers and as pianists, you need to be aware of that with yourself and your students. Mood states, in line with that. So when you know um, someone's coming, going through huge life event stress, that can really greatly affect your mood state, right? Perfectionism. Earlier today, we talked about this with Dr. Sue in our performance class, and it's something that I struggle with, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you young artists struggle with perfectionism. Sometimes, though, it may be unnecessary perfectionism, which causes unnecessary stress, which prevails physically. You might think it's silly, but there are studies that show that, okay? Um, as well as what coping resources you have. Maybe you don't have any resources, and that's why you're keeping it all to yourself. Your beliefs and attitudes, as well as your goals, motives, and volition. Now, to the other side, the more environmental one, but intangible, we have expectations and social pressure. That may be from your peers, your colleagues, other fellow, maybe, you know, in a competition, you can get pressured, by your teachers, by even your family. Class attendance, I put that frequency and pressure, because both as a student and teacher, I know that sometimes our teachers will ask for something, every, memorize this by next week. Have this set of repertoire ready by next week. And sometimes it's just not doable. Sometimes it's just not realistic. And that pressure can put on a toll. Again, it can give you stress, and which can manifest physically. Then teaching quality in line with that. Com competition, as I mentioned, and grading standards. Those who are in the conservatory. Media and audience scrutiny. And I would like to emphasize this one, because again, I'm a victim of this. Edited recordings compared to real life performances. We need to talk about how in this day and age, edited rec recordings are so accessible to us, but oftentimes we, we don't realize that these are edited for many days. 
These are amplified by software programs. And it's almost impossible to replicate that in real life. However, there are certain people, like me, admittedly, who want to replicate those edited performance. I want to sound like that. That's how I want to sound in this hall. But it's just nearly impossible. And if you stretch your, yourself out like that, and you have that pressure, that can contribute to injury as well. So, oh, before I move on, I said, I mentioned that, you know, you can reflect on your own playing and your, your students' playings. Did, I, did anyone think of other factors? Maybe I did not identify that may belong in any of these categories. No? Okay. So, building upon the framework of these four factors, I proposed integrating sport rehabilitation interventions into piano-related recovery. So, in my research, I examined the works of Santi and Pietro Antoni, who reviewed various sport re rehabilitation models and interventions. And among these interventions, three types stood out as highly effective and easily transferable to pianists. These are educational interventions, goal-setting interventions, and social support-based interventions. For each intervention type, I identified possible solutions for those four factors. So, for example, in the educational interventions, I've, I've identified educational interventions for the biological aspects, physical aspects, psychological, and um, social cultural, and, and so on and so forth. I will briefly mention all, but I was asked to kind of spend more time discussing the psychological and social cultural factors and solutions since these are m more often than not, they're over, oh, wait, sorry. Because often, actually, they're overlooked, but they are just as important as the biological and physical factors. So let's begin with the educational interventions. These are um, basic, it's, it is what it, it means. It's increasing knowledge and awareness so that we can address the different factors of injury. So for piano teachers, that means emphasizing the importance of rest, body awareness, coordinated technique, and practice environments. Um, such as responsive piano, adjustable bench, proper lighting, legible scores. So for biological factors, some educational interventions we can do as piano teachers is give body awareness exercises. And we're very fortunate that later this week, Professor Pan will give us many more um, exercises for that. But this, these exercises are not, cannot, do not just help educate students biologically, but they also promote mindfulness as well. And so in line with that, teachers should discuss stress and stress management techniques with their injured students to address the psychological factors, such as mindfulness exercises and mental well-being, mental wellness, and resources can be introduced to promote their well-being. For example, I invite all of you to close your eyes. Close your eyes. It's been two pretty long days, I think for some four days, five days now, and we've been caught up in all the exciting things that this festival has been bringing us. Last night, we had an excellent, exceptional performance by Professor Pan, right? I want you to listen to your body. Maybe throughout these past two days, five days, you, don't, you haven't realized that you've been carrying tension somewhere. I want you to listen to your body from head to toe. And now I want you to adjust, make adjustments in your body. You can feel that. Something's not right, something's not aligned. All right, you can open your eyes now. So it, again, it's just a one, two minute exercise and it may seem silly, especially because you're in public right now, but doing that for your students, doing that with your students or doing that for yourself can greatly alleviate a lot of stress and tension in your body. So um, in terms of wellness resources, we also have soundmindmusician.org, which is an organization of practicing musicians that produce posts and podcasts on mental wellness. Other resources include the Piano Inspires. If you're not familiar with it, I would highly suggest you subscribe to their piano magazine, as well as attend some of their conferences, the NCKP, which just happened a couple of days ago. We have Music Teachers National Association, and their magazine is the American Music Teacher. These two organizations, recent, most, um, especially recently, have been coming up with a lot of resources for wellness and um, talks and, op and forums about musicians' wellness. Additionally, 
providing musicianship activities for students or doing a, a musicianship activities can engage the students away from the piano, keep them productive and connected to music, and also promote a more positive environment, not thinking so much about the pieces they need to play. Uh, well, the pieces they need to play physically. So what they can do is, and I guess a lot of you are doing it because a lot of you are a little older here, but score studying, singing, conducting, watching concerts, and doing a discography discovery. So that's something I coined from what my teacher used to make me do. It's a discography discovery. And that's a tongue twister do. So you can try that, discography discovery. So what it is basically, you get um, a piece of music, better yet, a part of a piece of music, and even better, a phrase of music, and listen to different artists play it. Five, 10. Listen to how they play it, what, what differences they have between their interpretation, what you like about their playing, and why. So these things engage your mind away from the piano. So you, you don't have to do a lot of physical activities and still keep you engaged and connected to the music. So for, that, for social cultural factors, break, uh, be, piano teachers can provide hope and motivation by sharing stories of other pianists who have overcome injuries. The, when I was injured, I was really inspired by people who I know um, who were injured, but are great performers now. If you're not familiar with Artina McCain, you, you should search her and she has such an inspiring story. Um, also, we need to break the stigma of no pain, no gain. When you're playing the piano, if you're feeling pain in your arms, that does not mean you're improving, that does not mean you're getting stronger or you're playing better, or your technique is getting better. Uh, in the piano world, if you're, playing, if you're having pain while playing, you need to stop rest, that's an indication, get help from medical, um, get professional medical help and tell your teacher about it as well. So we don't talk about this a lot, but we need to break that stigma. That for the piano world, the no pain, no gain thing is not true. And also, like I mentioned, talking about edited recordings. Okay, now we go to goal setting interventions. So I, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with SMART, the SMART goals, and this is very important to apply SMART goals into, a, into lessons, not only for an injured student, but every, every week lessons. And as a pianist, as students, you, you should also have your own SMART goals. So SMART uh, goal, goal setting interventions offer direction and motivation for the recovering student. By setting specific, realistic, stimulating goals, we empower students to take control of the rehabilitation process. Piano teachers can guide their students by assigning appropriate warm-ups, technical exercises, and repertoire choices, gradually increasing the biological intensity, but always staying below the pain threshold. So one of my resources earlier was Janet Horvath's Playing Less Hurt. She gives specific suggestions for building up practice five minutes a day, um, then it becomes five minute chunks and then it grows to 10 minutes and so on. So if you wanna know more concrete ways of building up practice and setting goals, if you're injured or if you're going through injury right now, I suggest you go look at Playing Less Hurt by Janet Horvath. Now, to respond to psychological factors, which we'll dwell on, encouraging students to journal their progress and celebrate accomplishments can help them track their journey and boost confidence. So like I said, you, I, I think most of your students, so you guys should have your own journals actually. Um, and if your teacher does not write down your own lesson plans and all that, you should write that down. It can be as simple as, this is for example, someone was injured, right? But simple as saying what you did for that day and, what, what, and then every day do that. And it may seem for the first couple of days like nothing's happening, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. But if you keep going on after a month, after two months, after three months, you will see the progress and you should celebrate those small steps that you're taking. So you can also of course ask your students or you yourself, write down your own thoughts and your feelings during that day and kind of process that. And of course, when you're making your own goals, make sure they're relevant, reasonable and attainable just so that this will build, um, create a more positive mindset for yourself. Now, when the student begins working on a new piece or a couple of pieces, piano teachers, together with the student's families, can plan a small informal performance in front of family and friends to increase the feeling of support and positively impact the social cultural aspects of injury. Yeah, that's me. 
So social support-based interventions are also crucial for piano-related injury, right? Pianists can draw from various sources, family, friends, piano teachers, other students, but most importantly, medical staff. Now, incorporating social support activities and lessons are, are very good and um, helpful for recovering students. So it can be as simple as stretching together, promoting group activities, just like what you guys are doing here. And these enhance the sense of support and community. Teachers can also collaborate with parents to ensure a supportive practice environment at home. Going to the social cultural factors, what am I doing? Partnering with local or um, piano teachers associations to organize forums and seminars with previously injured pianists and medical experts address social cultural factors. So if you're someone who, who went through injury or who's going through injury or teaching someone who's injured, it will be really great for you to join conferences and create a supportive network, NCKP, MTNA. There's something called Pianists for Alternative Size Keyboards. If you, you're such struggling with because of small, hand and pian, um, small hands, you can foster a network with them. Another idea is to create buddy systems in your studio, or for you guys, get a buddy, practice buddy, who will help you, who will observe you, and you'll observe them, and you guys can help each other develop healthy techniques. And I do that with actually my friends in conservatory. Um, now lastly, to help with the psychological aspects of injury, piano teachers should always provide honest and positive feedback. As colleagues, you should always provide honest and positive feedback, especially honest, because we all know when someone's lying about their feedback, right? So it's very important. Um, but above all, empathy and encouragement from the piano teacher, they're vital through the rehabilitation process. Expressing understanding and support helps the injured student feel that they are not alone in their journey. And if you are going through injury, or if you went through injury, you should know that you are not alone in your um, recovery. You're not alone in your journey. It is actually more co common than you think for a pianist to be injured. Studies show that about 80% of pianists have gone through some kind of repetitive strain injury. So in conclusion, Pianists can greatly benefit from integrating the sport injury research into their approach to injury prevention and recovery by adopting a biopsychosocial perspective and implementing the educational, goal setting, and support based interventions we talked about. We can foster a more holistic and positive response to piano related injury. Again, these interventions are in no way exhaustive, but serve as examples of how we can aid recovery and prevent injuries in the first place, in your students and in yourself. If you want a copy of this model, so you can also tailor it to yourself, as well as all the resources mentioned earlier, I actually have a handout, but we weren't able to print it, so I, can, I would be happy to share that all with you. Um, so as piano teachers and musicians, we should adapt and tailor these interventions to suit our own in situations and environments. I invite you all to join me in applying the knowledge gained from athletes and sport research into your own piano pedagogy and into your own piano playing. Let's continue to explore and develop strategies that will contribute to the well-being and success of our students or your own success. And so together we can create a healthier and more fulfilling journey for every pianist worldwide, a more holistic and more supportive, more fulfilling journey for everyone. Thank you. Does anyone have questions or want to share an experience they had? No? Okay, well, if anyone wants a, a copy of the model, let me know and I'll, I will happily send this to you guys. Thank you.